Uh, sure, you know, one of the things that I was really excited about when I first read this manuscript was discovering that the world of the story takes place 64 years before the first book and the first movie, which gave me the opportunity for um, many more new sort of ways to world build. Um, to figure out how to do a period piece was really, really exciting, and I enlisted production designer Uli Hanisch, who's German-based, and together we decided to sort of focus on kind of reconstruction era Berlin right after World War II, since our story takes place just years after the dark days of war itself. And what that gave us was a sort of a look at what a city would look like with the rubble in the streets and the sort of reconstruction of old buildings and the erection of new buildings and that might lead in to, to Panem. But it also gave us an opportunity to look at the more rudimentary nature of technology and how people would look differently in terms of their clothes. And we looked to that same era, the 40s and the 50s, for references of automobile design and clothing and hair and makeup. and. So really, really fun, and it's just, it very much feels like a Hunger Games movie, but the world feels entirely new and fresh. Another one of the things that really drew me to wanting to do this project is we get to tell the origin story of a villain, and this is a character that everybody knows from the first books and the first movies and who everybody has learned and loved to hate. Um, and so the challenge was to find a way for us to visualize and dramatize a very different kind of story. And so we find Snow at a much younger age. He's near the end of his um, you know, high school years. He's hoping to go to college. But we, what we discover is that his family has fallen from grace and they actually don't really have any money and he doesn't sort of exist in the same hierarchy. And he's putting on a show for all his classmates and he desperately needs to win the prize at graduation just to support his family and to put food on the table. Um, and so we were able to get audiences to get behind him and to understand him and to empathize with him and to root for him with what he wants, um, but also fun to, through the journey of the story, show him sort of descend into darkness and become the snow that we know from the other films. One of the really interesting aspects of this movie, and especially for fans of the book, I think, is that we get to see the sort of the origins of a lot of things. We get to see the origin of snow, we get to see the origins of the games and how the games are changing, the origin of songs, all that kind of thing, all, all the, those kinds of things. The other thing that it does is I think in a really interesting way is once you get through the story in this movie, you start to look at characters in a different way. You actually can go back to the original movies and the original books and go, wow, I never understood that because I didn't know the backstory fully. And so if you go back to the, you know, a movie like Catching Fire and you realize that Snow has come to 12 and you may not at the time of seeing Catching Fire thought Snow would ever been to District 12. And then you come here and you realize he has a big history with District 12 and a big history with somebody really special in his life in District 12. And that definitely informs the way he feels about District 12 in general, but also about Katniss coming from District 12 and what, what she represents. The cast is um, just phenomenal, phenomenal in this movie. Um, Tom Blythe, who plays Young Snow, kind of came out of the blue for me. I was not that familiar with his work before. I hadn't seen his show, Billy the Kid. And his addition came in kind of late in the game, and he really just blew everybody out of the water. Um, I think one of the first things I was kind of drawn to, the physical side with the big blue eyes that you know had, Donald Sutherland has, and I could see like, oh, there could be some similarities. He could grow into looking and feeling like a snow. Um, but he's an amazing actor. You know, he's a Juilliard trained guy. He's really good at his craft. We knew he'd be able to play all the emotional aspects of the, the journey we needed him to go on. Um, but what's most important for me um, is that he has an intelligence and a sophistication about him and a sense of control. And that was really important in believing that he could become somebody like Donald Sutherland's version of Snow. The department heads are fantastic. I mean, many of the people um, I've worked with a lot before, you know, um, Yo Willems, who I go back to the music video days with, was the cinematographer. So we have a, a great shorthand and have sort of grown into a certain working style together and a certain visual style together. So that was fantastic. Um, Trish Somerville, uh, costume designer, she and I also go back to the video days and have done lots and lots of work together. Um, the new addition is uh, Uli Hanisch, who is a German-based production designer. 
And for me, that was a fantastic partnership on this movie, just because we were creating a brand new world. Um, and he and I got to sort of team up and kind of craft what this kind of post-war reconstruction era Pan Am looked like. Um, and ended up being sort of guided by that era itself, the 40s and the 50s, and how that informed hair, makeup, wardrobe, styling, the look. And so that ended up sort of informing a lot of conversations that I had with Trish or with Yo or with props or, you know, the music department, everything. I think Hunger Games franchise fans will love the film as a whole. I think that it stands alone um, as a very fresh and very unique um, and very relevant Hunger Games movie. But I think fans, compared to sort of new people coming in and discovering this movie for the first time without having read the other books, will have this kind of added layer of the sort of nostalgic connections, right? Because we're seeing origins of things that are familiar, they're going to find real joy in that. Um, and to sort of discovering new meanings to lines of dialogue or the songs or getting to see things like the hanging tree for the first time. One of the things that Uli, uh, the production is, and designer, and I decided to do was try and make this as authentic and as grounded as possible, and we wanted to shoot in as many real locations as possible. We only built really one, one set, which was um, Snow's apartment. Everything else was filmed on locations or in locations, and, you know, we had some building and some augmenting that we did to these locations, but it was just great because we could, you know, have sort of immersive experiences for all the cast members and all the scenes. So I found amazing, an amazing arena called Centennial Hall in Poland that we shot the games in, um, to this like strange but beautiful kind of crematorium that we used for Dr. Gall's lab, um, to using the exterior of the Olympic Stadium in Berlin that, you know, was where Jesse Owens ran in the, you know, the Hitler Olympic Games, um, you know, just kind of crazy locations, but really, really immersive. So Janus is um, what I consider to be the moral compass or the heart of the film. You know, um, he is originally from District 2 and was able to uh, move with his family to the capital after his father came into a good, bill of, uh, good deal of money. And um, yeah, he, uh, so I think he knows, you know, tributes being plucked out of the districts. He has, he has a real soft spot for that because he comes from the districts. He's a peer of Coriolanus Snow. Um, they have a bit of a relationship, you know, they're friends with one another, or at least Sejanus values his friendship. I mean, Coriolanus, it's kind of up for you to decide how he feels about Sejanus, but um, <clears throat> yeah, he really values that relationship, and I think he really, really tries to get Coriolanus to do good. Um, he just, he's, he's got a big heart, uh, I, to, to a fault, I think, at certain times. You know, how, how passionate uh, Sejanus is about um, changing the world that he lives in. Um, I really liked that. And, uh, you know, I always have a soft spot for characters who, you know, everybody is so accustomed to the status quo and the way that things go, regardless of how totally messed up it might be. And then, you know, you have the outliers that we kind of need in this world that are like, this is not right. Regardless of how many people are telling me that this is the way that things are supposed to go, like, this is not right. And I really admire those kinds of people, and so Janus is one of those people, and I, I think that really drew me to him. Yeah, I mean, I have good things to say about everybody in this cast. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I got to spend so much time with everybody, and, you know, Tom and Rachel specifically, we were kind of like, you know, we, we were together an awful lot. Um, we got to, you know, explore together, kind of go out together and see Germany together. And, you know, they're just, they're, they're just amazing, very, very special people to me. Um, I think Jason is the funniest guy I think I've ever met. He's the best. I can't wait for you guys to see him be Lucky Flickerman. He's, he's legitimately the funniest guy alive. Um, I mean, Peter's incredible. Every time he would do a take, he would play. Like, he really... 
he really would play with the dialogue and with inflections and stuff. You know, he was able to do this thing that I admire so much in actors, where, you know, you say all the same words in the monologue, you have a big monologue, you say the whole monologue, you have to do it over and over and over again because it's film, and each time you do it, there's little bits and pieces that you kind of tweak your tonality, and it has such a different subtext. It has like a completely different meaty energy that just has like slightly different color, and Peter would always give like something really interesting and you never did the same take twice, it was awesome. I loved watching him do that. Viola is Viola, I mean, <laughs> she's amazing. She came in and was legitimately so crisp, my jaw dropped, because I'm sure you've seen, you know, bits and pieces of the trailer, she's, she's got this whole thing going on. Um, and I, I, when I first saw her come up for like the speech at the reaping, my, my jaw legitimately dropped. I was like, I, I got real goosebumps. It was very, it was very crazy. It was quite intense. I love Francis Lawrence. I've, I, I'm sure you've heard this from a ton of other people in the cast, but he's, he is, he's, so incredible at being collaborative with his actors, uh, you know, and, and really making us feel like we can bring ourselves and our ideas to the roles, um, and which is so, so gratifying to feel like you have a hand in creating these characters with a director. You know, it really is like, that's what film is. It's a collaboration of a bunch of people, and Francis, I think, really, really has that in him. And he just like makes incredible decisions. I mean, he has such a good big picture mentality of like how things should look aesthetically, coloring, you know, he's, he's an amazing director. Yeah, man, I love to mess with Tom. <laughs> Cause he was so, uh, I mean, he's amazing. Like he was a very dedicated guy. Um, and there was a, yeah, there was this scene where my mom gives me cookies and then I give them to Coriolanus and it, you know, it's meant to be like a moment where I'm like, here, I, you know, I can't give you anything, but I can, I can give you this, you know, in an effort to kind of make him feel better about the, the, something that was happening. And they gave me real cookies to put in this little box that I was meant to give to him. Unfortunately, the cookies were really good. So I would get the cookies and then he would give me back the box in between each set. And he was like, you know, the box would get lighter and lighter. And then he would look at me and he'd be like, are there crumbs on your face? Cause I was, you know, in between takes, I would just eat the cookies, you know, they were really good. The cookies weren't on camera, so I would eat them, you know, otherwise they get stale. They were delicious. Whoever baked those cookies, I mean. I think thematically, it's so, so poignant. I mean, it's, it's got a, it's just, it's just, it just has so much heart. And, um, you know, as, how do I put this? It's like, it takes place before the Hunger Games were such a polished, spectacular, you know, event that it ends up being in the original trilogy. And I think because of that, there's this kind of added grit to it. And there's these added stakes and tension that kind of like throughout a good portion of the movie, you know, is present. It's incredible. I think they're gonna love the entire film. I think it will be exciting for audiences to get to see that this is not just the story of a young Coriolanus Snow and the origins of how a young man grows to be the President Snow, who we all loved to hate, um, but the origins of the Capitol as well, and of seeing, uh, we've heard reference in the original movies to the war, to the dark days, but we have only ever really seen the Capitol as this place that seen through Katniss's eyes, seen through the eyes of a person who's grown up in very different circumstances. We've never 
um, told a story before that is, takes place through the eyes of a young capital citizen, and especially somebody like Snow, who um, has, who's, comes from great wealth and power, but whose family has fallen um, into hard times that he's trying desperately to conceal from his peers. Um, but to see both in our very, you know, early images in the film, to get a sense of what that, the way that the war uh, devastated the capital and its citizens and what the destroyed version of the capital, not this sort of shiny product that it becomes, but um, in the midst of those dark days, what, ha what, had, what the capital had become. But to also then see as you meet Snow at age 18 as a senior, you know, at the academy, the, the beginnings of the Panem that you recognize, right down to, you know, the, the, the reconstruction of the old, but these new buildings that are going up, you know, the cranes, the skyscrapers, the attempt for um, a city that has been devastated by war to rebuild, reimagine, and move on. And so architecturally, you're seeing things you haven't ever seen. Um, and then when you get to the games, you're really saying another origin story, you know, that the games were not always filled with this incredible, you know, sort of sci-fi effects of an, these arenas that are so elaborate that it was once um, a much simpler affair. Um, and the, the advent and the reasons why uh, the games evolved the way that they did and the role that Snow played in it. So I think there's a lot for people to see um, across the spectrum of Panem through character, through the games, and through Snow that I think uh, people will find exciting, I hope. When we first meet Snow um, as a young man, um, we see that, let's say, he is a man very intent on keeping up appearances. He's ambitious, he's driven, um, but his hope is just to return his family to their former glory, to find a way to pay the bills. Um, nobody knows that when his father was killed during the war, that he doesn't seem to have done any really good financial planning, um, and that now the family is barely getting by, and it's really important to know that none of his peers know that. Um, he is doing everything he can with the help of, of Tigris to sell the idea that they are still the all-powerful Snow family, the, the, that Snow does, of course, land on top. And um, he's a young man being pulled in competing directions. You know, the, the warmth and optimism of someone like Tigris, um, finding out actually what their relationship was. Um, we, you know, we know by the time that the Mockingjay movies um, and the books have, you know, that, that Tigris is ready to help take Snow down and to end his reign. Um, but what we don't know um, up until uh, this movie is that they were once like brother and sister. She's his cousin, she's his, you know, looks after him and sees the good in him. He, and, and he has his friendship with Sejanus, who also, I think they, might have mixed feelings about each other, but they can at least somewhat be themselves with each other in a way that Snow can't be with his wealthier peers. And then you have the, you know, very powerful mentoring force of um, Dr. Gall, um, Viola Davis's character, who sees in Snow his potential, um, his Machiavellianness, his Machiavellian propensities, his trickiness, his charm, um, the, the, the chameleon in him, and, see, and hopes to bring out in him the kind of man that his father was, um, versus somebody like High Bottom, you know, played by Peter Dinklage, who knows um, just how dark his father was and um, has every intention of stopping Snow from becoming like him. Well, one of the most exciting things in reading this book was to suddenly look with new eyes on the original books and movies and to understand that that very you know, dramatic scene that takes place 
um, in, in Catching Fire in the first act where Snow comes to visit Katniss and to tell her, like, look what you've started. You need to knock it off. You need to calm things down. Um, that this is not uh, his first time in 12. This is not the first time he's dealt with a defiant and unruly young woman in 12. This is actually harkens back to a really pivotal, painful, um, you know, and transformational moment in his past. And it really does shed new light on his relationship with Katniss and how it feels to him to find himself back in 12. Um, and also his knowledge of um, just how disruptive those girls from 12 can be. Um, I think it's also uh, his, his, under, his relationship to uh, Mockingjays, um, to see that, uh, you know, this symbol that Katniss, um, you know, becomes so associated with and that becomes a symbol of rebellion, uh, that he has his own history uh, with the mocking Jason. He's not a big fan, never was, and never will be. Well, I mean, a producer honestly could not ask for a better partner than Francis Lawrence. He is, um, he's a really rare combination um, of, he has vision and he has confidence, and with that comes this incredible receptivity. And sometimes you will find in a creative partner that they can be either confident or receptive. Um, but true confidence is about actually really wanting and drawing out the best from all of your collaborators, all of your department heads, your actors. And Francis's sets, they're incredibly familial, they're inclusive. We all hang out a lot outside of the set. Um, and you see with each department head the way you know, he really brings the best from everybody and everybody feels like, you know, Francis wants you to bring him your best ideas to take chances, to take risks, and that he can find ways to in incorporate, uh, you know, the talents and the ideas and, and creativity of the people around him while still holding on to this vision and um, to the sort of certainty with which he is able to tell a story. You know, he is a great fit for Suzanne and for these books because, like her, he draws so heavily from theme and character. He's also an incredibly self-disciplined director. Um, you know, he treats um, our crew and cast with such respect, not just in the day to day, in the minute to minute, but in the hours that we keep and making sure to keep people like healthy and sane through the whole process and to bring joy and um, closeness to it. But it's also um, great to have a partner who is as sort of obsessed with detail as I am, as obsessed with the ideas and with keeping Suzanne's ideas her characters, her world building, to bring everything that we get from these books, to keep it alive, and to also make the choices that you have to make when you make an adaptation and what has to stay and what has to go. So you can't really ask for a better partner. It's been an incredibly joyful partnership and one that, um, you know, when Suzanne told us she had a new book for us to read, Kurtz, I was thrilled to read anything that she wrote. Thrilled to come back to Panem, but also thrilled to be reunited with Francis. We have an incredible casting director, um, you know, Deb Zane and um, Dylan Jury cast the movie, and, you know, their attention to detail, their relentlessness, their willingness to just keep going back until we find that perfect person in these younger roles where you're auditioning so many people um, really allowed us to find. Um, extraordinary talent to really, I think, be able to introduce new faces, but also, um, you know, to bring some of my most favorite actors to the screen in these um, roles that are some of the adult roles. You know, for Tom, to start with him, you know, to play a young Coriolanus Snow, um, you know, you have to have somebody who you believe can grow up to be the villain that Donald Sutherland was in the original movies. Um, but you don't want an actor who's trying to impersonate or mimic. That person has to find it in themselves and find it in performance and make it their own. 
And Tom brings incredible subtlety, incredible nuance, incredible kind of craft, really, to this character and to his relationships with, you know, the other cast members. He's an actor who, his performance is so dependent on his scene partner, he's not going to give the same reading. Um, you know, when we were in our audition phase or chemistry phase, he's never going to give the same reading twice um, because he's working with different actors and each one of them, he's really focused on what they're bringing. He also has to hold his own against the Viola Davises and, and the Peter Dinklage's of the world. Um, that is no small feat. Um, and so with Tom, you know, he's a movie star through and through. He can tell a story in a close-up with just his face. Um, he's smart. He is demanding of himself. Um, and he has a composure and a stillness that felt very true to Snow. Um, and an ability to sort of very subtly make transformations that I think you see towards the end of the movie where you really see him sort of his posture changes and his demeanor changes and just it's very subtle it's never clunky it's never loud it's just um, seeing a young man become the adult he will be and seeing Tom make that journey through the film is something that um, I can't imagine anyone doing better um, you know to cast Lucy Gray Baird is a really huge challenge because in addition to having a very complex character, you know, um, a young woman who has seen a lot, who's been through a lot, um, who is a performer, who can hold an audience in the palm of their hand, um, who can shape shift according to circumstance, um, and then sing like nobody's business, somebody whose voice and performance ability to perform and command an audience has to be, it's an essential part of her character. So to be able to do all of that on the, both the acting side and the musical side, and then to be able to do them at the same time, where so much of the kind of critical moments in the movie are, for her character, moments in which she is expressing her, herself through music. Um, you have to be able to do a lot of things incredibly well all at once. And, um, you know, Rachel's voice, it um, stops you in your tracks. When she sings in an on set, uh, she chose, which is very unusual, to sing live. Um, it's very rare for um, a singer or an actor in a musical um, performance to both have the pipes to do that the desire to do that and the love of the music to do that and the love of performance. And so, you know, we knew from just the emotion and power of those performances, you know, as we shot them, what an extraordinary gift um, she was for us. And, um, and I love that she is not um, like Snow. She is not a constant character. They are shapeshifters. They meet each other and connect through performance. They um, are not always who they seem on the surface, and they both know that about each other, and I find that really compelling and feel like these are both actors who are really able to pull that off. Um, you know, with Josh um, playing Sejanus, that was one of our hardest roles to cast. We actually had to rewrite the script a few times to get the Sejanus voice right because where he is really the conscience of the film, he is a person whose values um, are clearest and most um, passionately held and communicated. Nobody likes a goody two-shoes or really earnest character. It's really easy for a character to feel boring, pedantic. And Josh has this sort of incredible sort of sense of humor and, and, and very natural style. He's incredibly grounded as an actor. He is, not a showboat. He is not, um, he, he, he brings so much of himself, but he also brings this sort of fundamental goodness, but with a drive that is so great that he also is willing to take some crazy risks that become pretty darn scary for him and ultimately for Snow as well. And, 
Josh came in and he stole the part with his audition. We had just done a, a rewrite of the role, and so he was performing our new sides. He knocked our socks off, and then I discovered after I had loved his audition and he had really stolen the part that he happened to be the boyfriend of Rachel Zegler. And I guess I just wasn't up on my latest um, Hollywood couples, did not know that. Um, and was really surprised and thrilled to then get an unexpected call from Rachel's representative saying, um, well, she didn't think she wanted to go straight into another movie, but now that you've just cast her boyfriend, is it too late for you to reconsider her? I think Hunger Games fans, um, I think they will love the music. I think they will love to see where the music, um, certainly that they know from the original movies, where some of it came from, um, and how uh, these stories that um, were, you know, inherited by Katniss were actually passed down through music, and particularly through, um, you know, a song like The Hanging Tree from, from Lucy Gray. I also think that fans would love to learn. Um, there's so much that I've learned about some of these characters, some of their relationships, to learn more about, you know, Snow's background, to learn about the relationship to Tigress, to learn about, um, you know, the fact that there was um, a time when a young Snow might have gone another way. And it's very easy when someone is a villain to imagine that they were born that way. And I think it's very satisfying for the audience to really see the evolution of how a, a person like Snow, who's being pulled in these different directions, sort of finds his true self, in this case, not his best self, but his true self. Um, I think people will love, um, you know, seeing Trish Somerville's incredible wardrobe designs. I think they will love Dave Cobb and James Newton Howard's music. Um, and I think they will love seeing, let's say, powerhouses, like some of the m my most favorite actors in the world, um, the performance, you know, of of Viola Davis and of Peter Dinklage, Hunter Schaefer in as an amazing Tigress, um, and Jason Schwartzman as like a phenomenal sort of predecessor, the original, the first and only um, at this moment in history host of the Hunger Games, um, and um, to realize that Caesar Flickerman was the original Nepo baby. And, you know, in this day and age where so many movies um, are, are shot with, you know, incredible sort of green screen, digital backdrops, to be able to rely as heavily as we did on practical locations that spoke so vividly and specifically to, um, you know, the mythology and themes of this material was an incredible opportunity for us. Um, you know, we started out, ordinarily, try to start shooting with something easy. Uh, we did not do that. Um, we had to start, we had a little pre-production day that was relatively easy, um, except for a little bit of a wig crisis. Um, but then our first, you know, week of shooting, we were in the arena, you know, in Wrocław, in Poland, in this incredible, you know, historic UNESCO site, um, um, Centennial Hall. It is like the monumental scale of it. Thankfully, they gave us lots of places to show us arrows of where to go because you could get lost in there for days. Um, but to see, um, you know, th this location as a practical location and to use this arena um, as the, the setting for our games and to start with, like say, when, from a production standpoint, all of your, you had to have all of your tributes um, you know, all of their wardrobe, plus stunts on their wardrobe, all of your mentors and their wardrobe, all of your peacekeepers and their wardrobe. It was a lot to start with. And then these big action set pieces. Um, you know, we started with um, the arena in its uh, destroyed state and then later on came to the arena prior to that. And so, you are starting with, honestly, from for every department, some of the hardest work you'll do for the whole show, we started there because that's when we had access to this 
incredible location. And once we'd seen it, there was no way we weren't gonna figure out how to shoot there, but that was the window, we had to make it work. And so we really got to dive into the deep end. Um, and then when it came to some of our, you know, other locations, our bur you know, we had incredible, kind of some of the woodsier locations, some of which we shot in Poland near, um, you know, near the border of Czechoslovakia. But then to have, you know, um, in Germany, um, the exterior of the arena is the um, is is this the Olympic Stadium, where Jesse Owens ran, where you know Hitler and Nazis were sort of showing off to the world the power of um, the Reich, um, and trying to sort of pass themselves off as um, global citizens with the Olympics, um, and then and and to the that building is, it's humbling, it's history is humbling, it's architecture is humbling. Um, you know, where the, um, pre, where the mentors are watching the games um, and where Lucky Flickerman is, is, is uh, you know, hosting the games, that's shot in that same compound in an Olympic fencing arena um, from that same period. So to have these historical buildings that had um, so much uh, incredible power just because of where they were, what they were, what they stood for, and to be able to shoot in those was amazing. Um, and then just some of the scope and scale, you know, the, the set where the um, tributes interview um, are interviewed by the mentors is an, an incredible um, historic site in um, Leipzig. It looks like a set you would have built in any other movie, but we had just, you know, through our production designing design team, our locations team, some of the most, you know, like jaw-dropping locations I've ever got to work in throughout my career. Lucy Gray is a very compelling, enigmatic character. She's got a very mercurial sense of self, but she's always on her side when it comes to conflict with other characters in our story and with the world. Um, I find her to be so interesting and wonderful. She's got a lot of amazing musical abilities and she uh, has a very strong connection to snakes, which was very fun to act and also very fun to do uh, with the snakes we had on set. I remember reading the book in 2020 when it had come out and my we had one copy of the book that went through our house. So my mom read it first and said, Rachel needs to play this part. And then my sister read it and she said, Rachel needs to play this part. Finally, I got to read it and I just absolutely fell in love with her sense of strength. And um, she was so sure of herself. And I really, really love that about her. I think it's so inspiring. But also she gets to sing and play guitar, which is two things that I really love to do. And so getting to do that made it all the better for me to play this part. Working with Tom, who I worked with the most on this movie because we have so many scenes together, was such a joy. He's, he brings this light to set and this inherent knowledge and a sense of security in the material, in his own performance, and he's also so playful and, and truly like my goofiest friend. We just have such a nice time together. Um, getting to work with Peter Dinklage, fellow New Jersey resident, and, and well, not resident, fellow New Jersey born, Person. And I, I really adore him. We didn't have many scenes together, but the, the time we got to spend together off camera is something that I will carry with me for the rest of my life and for my career because he's so inspiring to watch. Every take is different, yet it is perfect. And, and you don't really get that with a lot of actors. I absolutely adore Hunter Schaefer. I think her as Tiger Snow is such perfect casting. And she brings this like old Hollywood beauty that we haven't seen in so long to this movie. And, and as a human being, she's just lovely. I've known Josh Andre Rivera for uh, four years now. He's my nearest and dearest, and so getting to share the screen with him again is something that I will remember for my life and everything that follows. Um, He's such a beautiful actor. I'm so proud of him, not only you know off screen, but on screen and, and, and getting to see him rise in, in such an incredible role as Sejanus 
is, is wonderful. I adore Jason Schwartzman. He's actually in one of my favorite movies ever, and I got to talk to him about that. Um, and also I got to sing with him on set, and his music is so wonderful. I was really nervous to like play guitar and sing in front of him. He was so supportive and just so happy to be there. I didn't have any scenes with Viola Davis, and I was very intimidated to go up to her. But getting to watch her and her scene with Josh and her scenes with Tom, so inspiring as an actor. They really lead by example and, and teach by showing. And so I, I just had the time of my life on this set with my fellow actors. Francis is not only a wonderful director in every way, but he's also just a wonderful person. And so coming to set every day and getting to talk to him and hang out with him, the dinners we would go you know, after work, on the weekends, he's wonderful company, he's funny, and he's just such a lovely person who cares about the people around him, cares about his crew, cares about his cast, doesn't want people to feel overworked. It's really, really, really wonderful. Um, and, and we both had a, a very similar idea for what Lucy Gray was going to be in this film and bringing her to life from Suzanne Collins' wonderful depiction of her in the book. Uh, he has a very uh, deep love of music and a passion for that side of things. So a lot of our collaboration came on what she was going to sound like vocally, musically. It's such an important part in the story, in the book and in our film. So having somebody who cares so much about the musical aspect was really, really important to me. And, and I trust him with my life and I would make every movie with him if I could. There were so many. I mean, I, I kind of got thrust into things without a lot of rehearsal when it came to the stunts. I was I had a previous engagement, so I, I, I was thrust into a scene called the bloodbath, which is the beginning of the games. And our A camera operator, Dave Thompson, gingerly would like push me out of the way of the camera because all of these kids are running at me with weapons and fists and angry faces, and I was terrified, um, and, and that worked for Lucy Gray, which was wonderful. I also got to spend time with real snakes on this set, and um, I got to film with two snakes, neither of which had names, but there's a sweet little garter snake that I kind of did a sleight of hand trick, because I didn't. you're not supposed to go hand first at snakes, and they wanted me to put the snake in my pocket, and I was very scared of getting bit or just scaring the animal. So I did a nice sleight of hand because the camera was behind me, and uh, we, I named him Kevin for the day, even though he didn't have a name. And then after every take, they would yell cut, and I would put Kevin in the air, and everybody would clap for him, and we would say, great take, Kevin. And I hope Kevin's doing well, and I hope he sees the movie. There's definitely um, a, a physical resemblance, which is, I think, going to be really interesting for uh, the fans to watch and to see the moments that Donald Sutherland depicted so beautifully, maybe not even knowing that he was doing so, where seeing Katniss is like seeing Lucy Gray for, uh, for President Snow during the quarter quell and during the 74th annual Hunger Games. Um, but there's also a lot of personality connections. Uh, they're very strong-minded, strong-willed, um, and, and golden-hearted. Um, I think Lucy Gray's intention is a little bit more fuzzy. And for Coriolanus, it's really hard to figure out uh, what, her, what her intentions are, if she's a songbird or a snake or both. And um, there's also this amazing connection in a way, even though it's about how they are different, where Katniss is a fighter forced to perform and Lucy Gray is a performer forced to fight. And it's interesting to see nature versus nurture in this film with Lucy Gray, with Katniss, but then also with Coriolanus, because we know him to be a dictator but we don't really know how he got there. And it doesn't seem like at the beginning of this film that he was born bad or that people are born bad. And so it's really, really an interesting um, dynamic to witness in, in our story. I think Hunger Games fans will love that it's something uh, that is fresh. It's a fresh take on the films and the stories that we love so much from Suzanne Collins. It's also very, very true to the book that she wrote. Why would you want to change something that is so amazingly written? Suzanne created amazingly dynamic characters with so many 
uh, facets, these multifaceted characters. Um, I think they're going to really love the performances from our, our cast. And I think they're also just going to love the music. And that that's my hope because it was really my baby while we were shooting was, was the music in our film. And so I really think they're going to be excited to be welcomed back into Pan Am, but with a, a whole new lens of the characters that they already think they know so well. A little bit about Corey Lanus. Uh, Corio is he's 18, he's in the academy in Pan Am. He's, uh, he's beginning to learn how to become a politician and a, a young kind of leader of, of Pan Am. Um, it's 65 years before the Corio or the President Snow who we met in the original series. Um, so he's not quite yet the evil dictator that we, that we know him to be. He's this young, ambitious um, kind of like zesty young man who, who is looking to kind of make a name for himself. But also his family is in dire need of food um, and he's trying to keep up appearances while also trying to provide for his family. I think what drew me to Corio is, I mean, aside from being a fan of the franchise uh, originally and going to see them when I was a teenager, um, what drew me to Corio specifically is his kind of, um, his multitudes, like, you know, he's not one thing, he's ambitious and he's hungry, but at the same time he tries to remain humble, and yet at the same time he wants to be the best in his class, and I think he's this, this person who contains just, just multitudes within him. Um, and when I'm looking at a character, I always look to play someone who contradicts themselves, because I think that's what life is like. We have an amazing cast, we're very lucky, I'm very lucky. Um, Rachel, Hunter and Josh, you know, we have this awesome young cast that are like somewhat new on the scene but are making a huge name for themselves, each of them. Um, and then we have this kind of like legendary OG cast who we all look up to, all of us, and then a massive extended cast of amazing international actors um, from all over the world and I just think in the original series, you know, you read about it as a fan, how much of a connection they all had, and I think it's a credit to the franchise that we were able to kind of like latch onto that, that, that chemistry as well. And it came back to life, I think, in a way that was really organic and fresh. Um, and, you know, I mean, Jason is one of the funniest people I've ever, ever met and brings this levity to the film, which um, I think really gives it another angle. Um, and there's, you know, it's great to see uh, these characters brought to life by people who are truly transformative. I mean, uh, Viola does this amazing thing where like, she steps on set as Viola and action starts, and all of a sudden she's Volumnia Gaul, and um, her voice and her face changes in a way that I've never seen an actor do before. So we are incredibly lucky, um, and I hope we get to do more. Francis is a really one-of-a-kind director. Um, I feel lucky to be able to call him a director and a friend now. Um, and lucky that he came back to this installment because um, I think he loves the world, I think he loves the characters, and uh, I think he loves Suzanne Collins, our incredible creator, a creator of the series. Um, and I think he is someone who is able to, in a really unique way, take an enormous world and an enormous franchise and make it feel really intimate and specific, which I think is a, a testament to him and his skill and his talent, but also his humility and, and what he brings to the work. He, he makes a big film as if it's a really intimate um, family drama, almost. Um, and then, not to mention the action pieces that he brings to the movie, the way he shoots action is just so dynamic and so raw um, and it hits you right in the chest. Uh, I, I feel very lucky to be working with Francis. Oh man, there's, there's one scene because Corio is always hungry at the beginning of the film because his family is struggling. Uh, there's a scene where Sejanus tries to sneak him a cookie uh, and it's in the book so Josh and I knew it was coming and somehow throughout this long day of filming with hundreds of people on set, Josh managed to make me uh, crack 
probably about 100 times. Um, we, were, we were trying to do the serious scene where I find out that the Hunger Games are, are happening, and Josh kept choosing the, the most inopportune time to hand me a cookie. Uh, and by the end of the scene, we were both covered in crumbs and cookie junk all over us. Um, and that is kind of mine and Josh's relationship, really, in a nutshell. Uh, we we like to crack each other up on set when we can and uh, throw the other one off and throw them curveballs. I think this movie is going to be quite rewarding to the fans of the original uh, series because there's a lot of Easter eggs and a lot of, a lot of connections between uh, this new installment, this prequel and the original series, uh, and a lot of explanation as to why Snow, President Snow in the original films, detests Katniss so much. I think, uh, I think Katniss in the original series reminds President Snow of Lucy Greybeard, um, and we get to find that out in this movie and in this book because it explains how Corio became who he becomes and how he becomes this dictator and, and why and why his hunger for power grows so strong. And a lot of that is because of Lucy Grey and because of her kind of enigmatic nature that he, he can't quite understand. So when Katniss comes along later on, when he's a lot older and a lot more powerful, I think she scares him because it almost feels like going back in time. I think what fans are going to love most about the film is that it's a return to the games, a return to Pan Am without being a repeat. It feels like it honours everything we loved about the original franchise while also revealing so much more that is new and fresh um, and answers a lot of unanswered questions about why our most beloved characters are how they are.